Um, hi everybody, my name is Carl Anderson and I am the owner and bladesmith of Anderson Forge. And I got, I got lucky enough to have uh, Michael, the, Michael the Vagabond worthy swing by here today to do some filming. We share, we share some interests which would be um, from traditional archery and knives and, and canoeing and, and anything to do with the outdoors. So it's of interest to him and me both. I want to show this um, to some of the people who have been kind enough to buy, buy some knives from me over the, the last um, 13 years plus now. Uh, might get a little insight into how I got sitting in this chair in a knife shop from the day I started. And I'll, I'll say that in 1996 my life took a a severe turn and headed me down a new path and I had to come up basically with some new things to do with my life and literally walking through a local grocery store and saw Blade Magazine. Now I take you back to growing up as a kid for just a minute I grew up with the father. It, me growing up was if I wasn't fishing I was hunting and if I wasn't hunting I was thinking about fishing or hunting and worked out real good because that's the same way my dad brought me up. We were in the basement reloading for fox hunting or putting to get putting new lines on our rods and reels. That's the way I lived my life. And didn't wouldn't matter if we were camping or fishing or hunting. Knives were part of that. But my idea of a knife for the majority of my life was going to gambles or coast to coast and buying a buck or a shred or um, a Rapala fillet knife or something. That's what I thought a knife was. Well, I, I'm in this grocery store in 1996 and I found Blade magazine. And I see this magazine and in it is K&G, knife and gun finishing supplies, a knife supply warehouse. And I thought, wow, people actually make knives besides knife companies. I'd never even, I guess I just never thought of it. So I ordered this I ordered this knife, and uh, Mike, it's the white one. Hand me that knife. All the way to the end, all the way to the end. White, right there. I get this knife, I, I get this knife catalog, and I order this knife blade. And if you look underneath this piece of Corian here, it's stamped Japan. Well, I'm building uh, our community's first assisted living warehouse here in town and there was a guy there working with us another carpenter who I didn't necessarily get along with it's just we uh, we um, we just put up with each other throughout the day he didn't like me particularly and I didn't think the world of him either well um, there's a company here in town that was doing Corian countertops so I got this ten dollar knife and I got some scraps of Corian and I put these Corian slabs on this knife. Well one day I take this knife to work and I showed it to this guy who didn't particularly like me. That's the real ironic part of my knife making career is he made fun of me. He made fun of me because this blade was made in Japan. And he said, well you, you ain't nothing until you make your own knife. Well I was real proud of this going to work that day, but I left he he succeeded in deflating any of my accomplishments that I thought I had made. But what he didn't know, and he I know deeply, he wanted to hurt my feelings, and he did. But what he didn't know was that he hurt my feelings so bad that I thought, well, I'm going to figure out how to make my own knife. And now I'm a journeyman smith in the American Bladesmith Society um, with testing for master smith on my horizon. So a guy who just really wanted to hurt my feelings and make me bad, quite honestly, it was a lot of the reason I'm sitting here today a professional knife maker. So I had, I, uh, about two years into knife making, 96, 97, and 98, I found myself, I was making some knives on my own and just really fumbling around. And I saw an ad in, a mag, in Blade magazine from a fellow by the name of Ken Largen, who's still making knives today and running the Knife Makers Co-op in North Carolina 
for Smoky Mountain Knife Works. And he had a, um, a shop southeast of Indianapolis in Indiana, um, about an hour east of Indy. And it was a three day, $600, $200 a day, make your own knife workshop. So I booked him and I went over there for three days. And I say this to all the people who might be looking at this video who are not knife makers, who want to be knife makers, who are just starting and fumbling around. I paid him the $600 because I wasn't accomplishing the things that I wanted to accomplish as far as these stainless steel stock removal knives were. I wasn't liking what I was coming up with and I had been in it a year and a half to two years and I went over there and we the very first day we took um, and it's the second knife Mike we I stood next to him at the grinder and we started working on this knife and I remember vividly this day, which is now 13 years later, standing there next to him and at about 15 minutes into the project of him showing me how to grind this, I remember thinking, I already got my $600 worth. Because I knew what I just learned in 15 minutes, I could go back and grind out a better knife than I had been doing in two years. And I learned the mistakes I was making just by watching him in 15 minutes. So it's my um, advice to anyone. Find a knife maker in your area. Find somebody that's willing to give you 15 minutes of their time and it can totally change everything you do and the way you think about the own knives you're making. And this was the knife from that three-day course. And I came home, the next knife is stamped right there on the spine, 01. This is the first knife I made on my own. And as crude as it may be in comparison to the things I'm doing today, it was leaps and bounds ahead of anything I had been doing for two years. And I learned a lesson, and that was in 1998 that I went to see Ken Largen. And then I happened to be, um, a lot of people don't know me or where I live, but I'm, you know, 100 miles or so south of Chicago, stuck out in the middle of nowhere. And there's a town about halfway from here to Chicago, 40,000 people, Kankakee is the name. And um, I happened to be looking in a phone book for something unrelated, and I saw a listing under Blacksmith. And I thought, wow, there's actually somebody professional enough and advanced enough to have a, a listing in a, in a sort of a, a larger town as a blacksmith. So I got a hold of him, and his name was Jerry Radis. I go up to Jerry Radis' shop and I walk into his shop and it may not mean a lot to some but there's a 500 pound, that's the ram weight, 500 pound um, air driven Chambersburg power hammer and a 250 pound Chambersburg power hammer and I, and I come to find out I'm standing in the shop of the world premier Damascus maker in 1999, the year 2000 and I've seen it once said that Jerry Radis makes the single most sought after Damascus made. And the guy's 30 miles from me. So it was fate. I, I just started making a nuisance of myself. And I think finally he just realized that I wasn't going away. That I was going to keep coming back. And I kept coming back and calling. And he, he's, uh, Jerry, just as an aside to that, forgot more about knife making than most people will ever learn. And he showed, he took me under his wing, gave me some philosophy, knife making philosophy that follows me in that front door of the shop every day. I walk in here and I do something that I learned from Jerry Radis, as simple as it may be. And I made a decision that every year of my life as a knife maker, I would go somewhere, find another knife maker, and have him, I would go to a seminar, I would go to a symposium, and I go all the time, every year, somewhere and learn something new to, to up the, the, the quality of my knives. Um, I'm, I'm not much on embellishment, I let the materials speak for themselves, but I'm a stickler on metallurgy. And I make, I'll, I'll list some guys real quick, I've made a nuisance of myself to people like, and this will, these names will mean something to a lot of people 
like Don Hansen, who's a master smith in the American Bladesmith Society, um, Ed Caffrey, who's a master smith and a teacher, Lynn Ray, who's a master smith and um, a student of metallurgy, and Kevin Cashin, who is known, who's on the board of the American Bladesmith Society. I call these guys, I talk to them, and I learn. And um, I think that the, if you're going to put your name on a knife, you're going to stamp your name on a knife, it should reflect, you should be proud of that name. Somebody somewhere down the, in years to come are going to pick up that knife and it's going to have your name on it. And be proud of it and know that the money you took for that was money more, the knife is worth more than the money that the customer spent on it. And that, it, that there's a little bit of heart and soul in that knife. And if you don't do that, I think you're doing yourself and the knife world a disservice. Um, so I went from stainless steel to to uh, forging and now power hammers and presses and I do all my own metallurgy. I'm just making the best knife I can. And that's kind of how I ended up here. Um, some of it was intentional. Some of it I'm just a victim to it. I'm an addict of it. Um, I love the people that I met. My customers are I've got customers all over the world, hundreds in the United States that um, feed me and, and keep me clothed. So we're going to end off this introduction and we're going to go in and I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got a bar of Damascus that is already made up. It's in, and we're going to forge, hand me the other, other knife. Nope, the only, yeah, that one right there. This is a knife that, um, the kind of knife I'm making today, and I'm known for making knives that, that take down um, with, to allow for full maintenance of the knife inside and out. And I like this profile. I like the size and dimension of this. And I'm gonna forge this blade, a blade this size, out of a bar of steel, out of a 336 layer Damascus that I made, and hopefully we're gonna get a bunch of it on film. So we'll see you in the forge.